Okay, folks, we're ready to get started. First of all, greetings and welcome to Fort Fisher State Historic Site. My name is Jim Steele, I'm the site manager, and I know I speak for all the staff at Fort Fisher when I welcome you to this important occasion. Today is a very special day. We are proud to unveil a new exhibit at Fort Fisher. It is called A Memory of People Could Not Forget Lumbee Indians at Fort Fisher. This exhibit is the latest in a series of collaborations between North Carolina Historic Sites and the Lumbee Tribe. It focuses on the little known story of Lumbee Indians during the Civil War, in particular, their experience as conscripted laborers building fortifications at Fort Fisher and throughout the Lower Cape Fear, and their resistance to such forced labor. Curated by a team led by Nancy Fields of the Museum of the Southeastern American Indian and designed by North Carolina Historic Sites Specialist, this exhibit is the most in-depth examination of the subject ever seen at Fort Fisher. Drawing on historical records and folklore traditions, Nancy and her team have done an amazing job telling the tragic story of lumpy conscripts at Fort Fisher and resistance on the home front. Today, I look around me and I see people representing a multitude of organizations. The Lumbee Tribe, the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources, the North Carolina Department of Administration, the Friends of Fort Fisher, University of North Carolina at Pembroke, and many other organizations. I also see a great deal of racial, ethnic, and cultural diversity in this crowd. What else could bring such an assembly of people together here at Fort Fisher, North Carolina, the home of the Confederate Goliath, but a new and exciting exhibit about an obscure and somewhat controversial subject. Here at Fort Fisher, we are committed to telling every bit of the Fort Fisher story. With the help of the Lumbee and their exhibit, we are telling a complete story and not shying away from uncomfortable truths. It is this dedication to telling human interest stories and finding ways to forge an emotional connection with all Americans of every background that makes Fort Fisher and this new exhibit so special. So I thank you all for being here. Now, now introduce the chairman of the Lumbee Tribe, Mr. Harvey Godwin. Thank you, Jim. I just wanted to do a brief uh, welcome uh, glad to have my family here with me today. And I'd like to recognize uh, several people that are here. Thank you for showing up. This is a great, great day for our, our people and all people. I'd like to recognize the Lumbee Tribal Elders, uh, the Tribal Youth from the Boys and Girls Clubs here, and uh, they have a shirt on that says Fibonacci. And if you see these pine cone patches, that represents the back side of a pine cone. And the pine cone has spirals in it. And these spirals are unique in number and spirals to other spirals in nature, like the Milky Way and like sunflowers. And it all in time means the constant in nature and in history and in humanity, because these numbers and these spirals are constant. And that's what our youth mean to the Lumbee people. I'd like to recognize the Lumbee Warriors Association, Reverend Gary Dees, honoring our vets. Ever who's a vet here today, please stand and be recognized. Thank you for your service. I'd also like to recognize Lumbee clergy that may be here today. I'd like to thank the Lumbee tribal staff for standing around here for this setup today and all the hard work and planning and execution that they do. I'd like to recognize the Lumbee tribal council. Please stand and be recognized. The Lumbee Tribal Government is made up not just the administration, but in joint effort with the Lumbee Tribal Council, along with, with the uh, executive and the legislative and uh, the judicial. So we're all working together on common good for the Lumbee people. I'd like to recognize from the Commission of Indian Affairs and anyone who, who is here from the Commission of Indian Affairs and Executive Director Greg Richardson. Quinn Goblin from the Governor's Office of Public Engagement, UNC Chancellor, my good friend, without him this would not be possible today as well, Dr. Robin Cummings. <laughs> Ms. Nancy Fields, the Museum of Southeastern American Indian, who has been the 
catalyst for this endeavor that's taking place here today. Uh, DOA Secretary, new Secretary, Ms. Uh, Pamela Cashwell. And this person has become a close mentor and friend of mine, uh, Director Michelle Lanier, North Carolina Division of State Historic Parks. She's the one that initiated this fine effort. Thank you for being here today. <laughs> Ms. Sarah Koontz, Acting Deputy Secretary and State Archivist. And my good friend for the last two or three, for, since 2018 I'd say now, uh, Site Manager Jim Steele. I want to thank you for your patience your hospitality, and everything that you've done in just a professional way throughout this uh, endeavor. And to all Lumbee tribal members and friends that are here today, I'd also like to recognize our brothers and sisters from the Kahari, Meharin, and Waccamaw Suwon for being here and for striving with our people during the Civil War right here in this very space. Thank you all for being here today. God bless you. And next, we have the Reverend Gary Deese with the Lumbee Warriors, Warriors Association. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Let us pray. O oh, gracious eternal God in heaven, as we gather here today for this special occasion, we want to thank you, Lord, where you brought our people from. The vigorous work they've done here at Fort Fisher during the Civil War. Lord, how they labored here for what we see today. And Lord, we thank you for our leadership that has put this together, Father. We thank you for our Chancellor, Chancellor the First University for the Lumbee people. Oh, Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for each and every one that has a part in this. Lord, most of all, we thank you for you, God, because you brought our people an awful long ways. And Father God, we thank you today for our tribal chairman, Lord, the one who has set the example for other leaders to follow. Father, he took care of the, uh, bringing back the culture to our Lumbee people. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great leadership of our Lumbee people. Has a desire to continue to march forward as the Lumber River flows. We continue to flow as well. Oh, Heavenly Father, again, we thank you, Lord, for this day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And now we will have the re Remembrance Song by Kaya Little Turtle. Hello, uh, my name is Kaya Little Turtle. I'm the Cultural Enrichment Coordinator for the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina. I'm very honored to be here today to be able to, uh, to render this song. A lot of our people came here, a lot of our native people came here a lot of them against their will and some of our people didn't get the opportunity to make it back home and even those that um, that came home they carried a lot of hurt with them when they came home and so this song is going to be a song uh, for all of them and for all of our people um, and you know what we're carrying and what they carried back then we wanted to do something special um, we want to do something uh, meaningful on these grounds here today as we, uh, as we remember uh, the sacrifices and the struggles that our people made here. So I'm going uh, to render this song in a good way for it to be good medicine, uh, not only for our ancestors, but for all of us here in attendance today and for all of our families and for our communities that when we leave from here today, that we take that good medicine with all of us because in the, in the hard struggles that we face, uh, good medicine is just a good thing to have. So, Hey, 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 hey,
I'm a little nervous. To, uh, a little nervous today. I opened my ward and spilled it on my pants. I don't want you to think something different. So. <laughs> I usually don't do something like that. <laughs> if I was gonna do that, I should have done it on the way here, right? <laughs> uh, I'm happy to say that my wife Sheila's here with me today, and uh, this has been a tough year for all of us. Uh, getting on the other side of the pandemic and during the pandemic she uh, contracted uh, breast cancer and survived it so i uh, happy that she's here with me today uh, this place is very special to me and uh, my family especially my mother Foda the first time I ever came to the beach with my siblings was in 1965 with my Aunt Paree, who is Lumbee and had married into the Waccamaw Suon tribe in Bolton, we better know as Buckhead. And she brought us here to the beach along where these condominiums are that used to be hedgerows. And you, you just open up, you could drive between it and you open up to this beautiful beach. And that's the first time I ever came here. And uh, I was about 10 years old. And then I raised my sons here out on Fort Fisher and down by on the other side of the aquarium uh, fishing and coming here in the 1970s. Then in the 1980s, I was uh, blessed to uh, by a friend of mine, David Oxendine, to cast me as Henry Barry Lowry in the outdoor drama Strike at the Wind. And I did that role in the 80s for uh, six years. And during that time when I got that role, I had to study and try to learn who Henry Barry Lowry was. And while studying him, I learned about Fort Fisher and how our young men laid out to uh, try to prevent themselves from, from being captured to be brought here. And during those days, we didn't have one of these cell phones and internet. I actually had to go into the library, Pembroke State University, and read. Uh, and the information was there and still there. Thank you for that. But uh, about 12 years ago, my wife and I were on our, uh, during one of our wedding anniversaries, we came here. And I could never step foot on this property not even come across the road from the beach. And when we did, we walked this land and there was not one word, not one syllable about the Lumbee people and the other tribes that toiled here. And that kind of started a quest for me to see if we couldn't change that. And uh, so we started working on that. And during the Civil War, uh, many lied out near Moss Neck Station, that's where I live now, in an area called Scuffletown. This bolo I'm wearing today was presented to me by my wife many years ago and has the image of Henry Barry Lowry on it. During those times, the Lumbee were free but did not have voting rights, the right to an education, or the right to bear arms. And that happened before the Civil War, during the Civil War, in the Reconstruction years after the Civil War. But there was one particular family in the Lumbee community of Scuffletown who was kind of singled out, the Allen Lowry family. They were targeted because they were skilled carpenters and would have been deemed valuable in building and maintaining the breastworks of Wilmington. Henry Barry Lowry, the youngest son of Allen Lowry, lied out 
and was treated as an outcast because of his proud nature to resist. That sound like Lumbees today, resisting, don't like to be told what to do. And he was later, and he later proclaimed war in Robinson County after the death of his father and his brother were murdered by the Home Guard. But even before that, it was stewing because of all of our young men, many of our young men being forced in labor down here and brought down here. And Henry Berry, like so many others, lied out. And they lied out just not for their personal safety, but they lied out against oppression and later fought for his pe people's rights and freedom. Henry Berry was special. Many of our other young men could not escape. They weren't as fortunate, and they ended up where we are here today. This week is the 52nd anniversary of Lumbee Homecoming in Pembroke. It's made possible by the sacrifices of our ancestors being recognized right here today. Strike the Wind is up and going again, and we'll be playing July 4th at the Lumbee Tribes Culture Center, Adolph Dahl Amphitheater. And Chancellor, I want to thank you for the great collaborations that you and I have had, the visions that we have shared together, bringing Strike the Wind back, being able to be here today, and all the other great things that we've done together for our people. I want to just thank you for that friendship and for that collaboration. Today we honor ancestors who toiled here, suffered here, and died here, who exemplified the core values of the Lumbee, our belief in God, the value of an education, identity as a people, and our connection to the land where we live. Those who fought the good fight for all of us, we recognize here today. During this time, six years ago, when I felt that this place had the opportunity to include words about our people, I reached out to the Governor Roy Cooper administration. And it's his leadership to let us where we are today, to have the historical inclusion mindset to where he would include people of all color and recognize their histories. And I want to recognize him today. So this government-to-government -government collaboration that we have between the state of North Carolina and the Lumbee tribe is making positive things happen for our people, just as what's happening here today. A great friend that came out of this and spearheaded this on behalf of the governor was Director um, Michelle Lanier of Historic uh, Parks. And I want to commend her for leading the way for development of American Indian narratives into exhibits and programs throughout state historical sites. And thank you for that phone call and that letter I got from you in 2018, the True Inclusion Project. And that's what this is, the True Inclusion Project. Thank you for that. <laughs> Chancellor, again, thank you. And Miss Nancy Strickland, your collaboration with the staff from the Lumbee Tribe, all the meetings we've had, all the wars we've had, all this heated discussions we've had trying to get to trying to get down to the truth what's real and what was real for our people thank you for that and for your patience in that journey that we've been on I have some people from this uh, tribe I'd like to recognize Ms. Tasha Oxendine head of P our PR director for her involvement in this project our tribal uh, administrator Ms. Tammy Maynard and most of all who has become our tribal historian and she's always in the background she's very humble but she has a heart and a passion for her people and knows how to do research and find out the truth miss karen bird let's give her a <laughs> and last uh park manager jim Steele, your insight and graciousness working with our tribe has been uh, a true blessing to me and for your patience and your collaboration and your willingness to get to the truth. And th those are your staff that work with us day uh, after day to try to get to this point. And there's gonna be more days to come when we find out more of our history here. And I wanna thank you for that. So now we have a few gifts I'd like to uh, give uh, to some people. Uh, the first one is one for uh, Governor Roy Cooper And Secretary Cashwell, I was hoping that you would accept this on his behalf. These gifts were made by the Boys and Girls Club of the Lumbee Tribe under the leadership of Dr. 
uh, Rosemary Larry Townsend, and our culturalist over there, Reggie Brewer. I'd also like to recognize uh, Mr. Jim Steele and for his work with us. Well, these are handmade pottery by our uh, youth at the Boys and Girls Club. And last but not least, a good friend of mine, who, a person who believes in inclusion of all people, who knows how to get to the truth of the history of people and has become a true friend to me and, as I said before, a mentor and going forward and trying to recognize people in the right way across the great state of North Carolina, Ms. Michelle Lanier. Yes, ma'am. My Lumbee brothers and sisters, members of the Kahari tribe, the Maharan, the Wakamasuan, but let me just say, it's a great day to be a Lumbee and God bless you and thank you. All right, I now want to introduce Ms. Lynn, Michelle Lanier. She is the director of North Carolina Historic Sites and Property and an old friend of mine. And I'm sure she's going to have a lot to say to you. Thank you. Thank you I, I am so full. Uh, the, the warmth in this tent is not just about the fact that we're in summer. <laughs> I can feel um, joyousness, joyfulness, and it's just so such a blessing to be here with all of you. I do want to acknowledge Secretary Cashwell, Chairman Godwin, our acting um, Deputy Secretary of the Office of Archives and History, Sarah Koontz, um, Director Greg Richardson. It's so wonderful to see you. I need to acknowledge some staff from the Division of State Historic Sites and Property. Uh, the staff for um, Fort Fisher State Historic Site, if you all could either wave a hand or stand, I want to acknowledge you all. They worked so hard. Thank you. We also have um, division staff, Jeff Bockard, and we have Stacy Montebello, if you all could stand. And I see other uh, department staff, John Mintz. Hi, good to see you. And I also want to acknowledge that we have a former um, colleague, uh, Kawan Allen, who worked very hard on this particular effort. If we could just applaud her efforts as well. <laughs> so I am someone who certainly is a public historian by profession. My training is actually as a folklorist. I was called probably from the age of nine, to bear witness to the rich cultural traditions, not only of my people, but the people who I share land with. Um, my roots are here in North Carolina. I have ancestry in Wayne County and Cumberland County and Wake County and Franklin County. And I grew up in South Carolina because my grandfather was a retired drill sergeant and retired at Fort Jackson. When I came back to North Carolina, my ancestral land, I was in awe of the rich, vibrant, living, living, living American Indian tribal community that I witnessed. And it was humbling um, to learn that the largest American Indian population east of the Mississippi is right here in North Carolina, my ancestral space. And while I am not a member of a tribal community, I am extremely humbled by, inspired by, delighted by the tribal cultural traditions that I get to witness every day. And I am always reminding myself that no matter where I walk, my feet are touching tribal land. So it is truly, truly um, a calling for me to be of service to each and every one of you. 
Um, I've said this story before, but I have a feeling some of you have not heard it, so I'm going to keep saying it until everybody says, we've heard it, Michelle, we've heard the story. Um, I started out as the curator of cultural history for state historic sites 15 years ago. So I've been walking this walk for a while and then went on to help create the African American Heritage Commission in our department and reached out to Director Greg Richardson and I said, I know we're not in the same department, but I would like to be in solidarity with the important work that you're doing with the Commission of Indian Affairs. If I could just come and say hello or if we could work together, that would be such an honor for me and also an opportunity to learn from someone like Greg Richardson. And he took me up on that and we grew to connect over the years. And as I grew the African American Heritage Commission, my work did connect with historic sites over the years, but it certainly became also about art um, in a big way as well. So, lo and behold, under Governor Cooper's administration, I was asked if I would be willing to come back to the Division of State Historic Sites and Properties in a new role as the director. Well, my first call when I got that mind-blowing invitation was not to my daughter, was not to my husband. My first call, my very, very first call, was not to an aunt or an uncle or a parent. My first call was to Greg Richardson. And it was because I remembered in my previous role that there had been a, what I would say, an unacceptable lack of inclusion of so many of the rich histories, narratives, community connections that needed to take place in our division and I told him he had my word that I would do everything in my power to change that and that he had my permission to hold me fully accountable to that promise and so so far some of the some of our accomplishments um, that we've been able to achieve um, were the cleaning out of magazine springs which is sacred to the Halawa Saponi tribe um, we have had the, the very last large event that was here right before the pandemic. We had Lumbee representation right here on these grounds in a variety of ways from cultural practitioners to scholars um, and leaders at the uh, commemoration and the reenactment of the second battle of Fort Fisher. We have been working uh, with the Catawba tribe in South Carolina at the President James K. Polk State Historic Site to connect those relationships. At Fort Dobbs, we have been working with uh, enrolled Cherokee members to help tell the story of the French and Indian War there. We are not done. This is just the beginning. I know that I have not named all of the tribes, so I have much more work to do. I have more relationships to grow. Please do hold us accountable. Please continue to look to us as partners. We are so excited about this exhibit. I think that it is beautiful. I think that it is a testament and a testimony to what this land has witnessed. This land has witnessed the feet of white people and black people, Union and Confederate, United States Colored Troops, Lumbee, Wakamasuan, Kohari, Maharan, who were forced to labor with their hands. Some, as we heard before, who did not make it. Some who died on this ground and were not consecrated in the ways that their communities would have had them to be consecrated. So this is sacred land. This is holy land for all of us. This is your land. This, this place is sacred to you. And it is truly, again, an honor to be one of the many stewards of the memories that this land witnessed. Thank you so much. Speaking next is Sarah Kuntz, who's the Acting Deputy Director of the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources and the State Archivist. Sarah? Thank you all so much for being here today. It is a real honor to join in this dedication, and I want to thank everyone who had the vision and the catalyst for making this uh, exhibit possible today. It's, it's, it's an honor. Um, as Jim said, my name is Sarah Kuntz. Um, by training, I am with the State Archives. I'm the State Archivist. 
I'm also the Acting Deputy Secretary for the Office of Archives and History, and it's my pleasure to um, serve as a colleague with Michelle in, in all of her work as a sister division within that office. Over the past few years, the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources has placed a renewed emphasis on making sure that we tell the story of all North Carolinians, especially in the Division of State Historic Sites, where Michelle is leading this effort that she calls true inclusion. That means just what it sounds like, including the stories of everyone who lived in our state and affected its history, including the stories of Native Americans, African Americans, women, and those who impact on our history as a state may have previously been downplayed or outright ignored. Today, we recognize the vital role played by Lumbee Indians in building Fort Fisher's massive earthworks. Working alongside enslaved African Americans, these individuals were forcibly conscripted and transported more than 100 miles from their homes to construct this Confederate fortress. This remarkable exhibit includes personal accounts of Lumbee Indians who worked and struggled and even died here. It provides a more complete history of how the fort was built, acknowledges their contributions of the people who constructed it and highlights their sacrifices and their stories. These stories can now be shared with the nearly 1 million visitors who come here annually. I would like to express our departmental thanks to the Museum of the Southeastern American Indian and the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina who guest curated this exhibit. We are so grateful for your insights and your contributions, and I'd like to particularly recognize uh, Chairman Godwin for his support in this effort as it went on. And now it's my honor to um, welcome the Secretary of Department of Administration, Pamela Brewington um, Cashwell. She's the first American Indian woman to head a cabinet department. So that's a very meaningful thing to say. Prior to her appointment as the Department of Administration Secretary, she served as a Senior Policy Advisor and Chief Deputy Secretary for Professional Standards, Policy and Planning at the Department of Public Safety. And before joining DPS, she was the Assistant Director at the State Ethics Commission. She has 10 years of federal government service as a trial attorney in the Civil Rights Division and the Office of Justice Programs at the United States Department of Justice as well as the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of Virginia. She holds a BA in Economics from Chapel Hill and a JD from the UNC School of Law. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Cashwell. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deputy Secretary Kuntz, for your introduction and for your strong support, as well as yours, Michelle for um, all things Native in North Carolina, but particularly the um, annual American Indian Heritage Month celebration, as well as working to preserve other sites in North Carolina that are important. Um, I also want to thank the Lumbee Tribe and particularly Chairman Godwin for inviting me. And Chairman Godwin, I just applaud your vision, um, your tenacity in seeing this through to fruition. And so just appreciate all that you do in North Carolina, not just for the Lumbees, but for all Indian tribes in North Carolina. Thank you for your leadership. Am I not? Okay. I, I never get accused of being too soft. So I, I, I try not to talk too loud. So um, is that better? Okay, good. Um, I also want to extend a special thank you to the Museum of Southeast Amer to the Museum of the Southeast American Indian and the North Carolina Department of Cultural Resources again for their partnership um, in bringing forth this very necessary and powerful exhibit. I'm super excited to participate today in this important event. I hail from the Lumbee and the Kohari tribes, and this story of the Lumbees was new to me. I had never heard this story before, and um, I will tell you that when Tasha Oxendon reached out to me to invite me to participate and sent some information, I immediately was like, absolutely clear my schedule. I want to go and be a part of this very historic event, and also I wanted to learn. And um, I've really enjoyed looking at the exhibit today. I would encourage all of you to spend some time there just um, reading it, all the information. It's so insightful. It does not escape me also today that I would not be here as the first American Indian woman to lead a cabinet agency in this state were it not for the strength of my ancestors. So many great Native leaders have come before me in North Carolina. But as we know, the path for Indian tribes in North Carolina has not been easy, and this exhibit sheds light 
on but one part of that very difficult but important history. This exhibit gives our ancestors a voice. It provides insight through text, images, maps, and artifacts of not only those important contributions, but has already been mentioned today, the mistreatment of Lumbee Indians during the American Civil War. And that's an important story to tell. The exhibit explores the trap of conscription labor, labor and what it meant for Lumbee Indians who were forced to work and in many cases who were forced to abandon their families, come here, and as was mentioned, ultimately give their life. It details the accounts of malnourishment and isolation, exposure to brutal physical and environmental conditions. These men who despite being deprived of the ability to serve in the military contributed valiantly to the war effort alongside free and enslaved African Americans. This exhibit is pivotal as it not only honors their memory, their grit and their determination, but it also builds upon our state's history in further educating North Carolinians on how this fort came to be, and more importantly, it celebrates the life of the many individuals who were responsible for the construction of this fortress. Again, I would like to thank all of you for inviting me. I um, thank you for bringing this important information to the citizens of North Carolina. Um, it just really shows the remarkable strength of the Lumbee tribe, which we know exists, but um, we have to keep sharing that message with everybody else in North Carolina, the strength of our tribe. I'm so thrilled to see young people here today. Um, it is just uh, important that we continue to share our history with our young people. And so I appreciate who, the folks who brought them from the Boys and Girls Club today. Thank you all again. Thank you to all of you who are here, who are interested in learning about this history. And I hope that you'll go back to your communities and share that with people in your community. Thank you again for having me. Next up is Mr. Robin Cummings, the Chancellor of the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. Thank you and good good morning, almost good evening. Um, so I realize fully that I stand, I'm part of the people standing between us and Fuller's Barbecue. <laughs> so my comments will be brief and I'm, I also recognize it's hot. But as I was sitting there thinking, you know, think about the folks who worked out here in the sun without shade. At least we have this beautiful br br uh, breeze that's blowing provided by God. So we can endure just a few minutes of heat and discomfort to honor to honor these these great people but it is a special day as we celebrate the opening of this exhibit to memorialize a part of history which is so meaningful to the Lumbee people first I do want to thank and I won't repeat but I do want to thank all those who had a part in bringing this exhibit to life I I thank especially our curator Nancy Fields of the Museum of the Southeast American Indian. If you haven't seen our museum, you should drop by the university, your university, and come and see that museum. I know Nancy will formally recognize uh, many who are involved with her. Let me say what a privilege it is for me to share the program with Chairman Godwin and with Secretary Caswell. Pam, again, you have a standing invitation to come, and I'd like to give you a, a personal tour of, of our campus. And Harvey, each time we get together, it's like this mutual admiration club that we start. Um, you know, God does raise up leaders, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. But I believe uh, that I look at Greg Richardson with uh, the Commission of Indian Affairs and the incredible work that that man has done with our commission decade after decade. And Greg, I hope you are grooming your successor, because I know one day you're going to want to retire and come here to the beach. Please do us that honor, sir. But Harvey, your vision for our tribe and for this area knows no limit, and this is part of his vision. Uh, another part of his vision, I was honored to be involved with a group with the executive director from, of the Lost Colony as he came and spoke to Harvey and myself about his concern that the American Indian roles in the Lost, Lost Colony should be played by American Indians. And I believe, Harvey, this is the first year that that's going to happen. Out of 84. Out of 84. So that's a, Harvey, 
Harvey was in the right place. He grabbed onto that idea. It's one thing to be in the right place, but it's another thing to grab onto it and make it the right thing. And he made it the right thing. So, so proud of you, brother, and all that all that you do. I, I my world's collided a little bit this morning. I met Ken Strickland, who's a big uh, supporter of UNC Pembroke and all that we do. He's he's he believes in our school of education and and uh, educating teachers. And then I ran in, after meeting, talking to Ken, I ran into a guy who said, you don't remember me from 1995, but you operated on me. And sir, would you stand up? I, I'm sorry, I forgot your name in the heat of the moment. Still alive. Who? Stuart Reed. Stuart Reed. And yes, he's still alive, Harvey, still alive. I will say my oldest patient has just celebrated his 92nd birthday after 30 years operating on him 30 years ago so uh, the importance of education to the Lumbee people cannot be overstated and if you look at all American Indian people in North Carolina but especially the Lumbee and the impact that UNC Pembroke has had on our tribes is phenomenal so Fort Fisher and the Civil War had a profound impact on the Lumbee history and it played a very important role in the establishment of the University of North Carolina at Pembroke and that's what I just want to spend the next two minutes talking to you about. Until the late 1800s, the Lumbees were not yet recognized as a tribe by the state of North Carolina. And when the state began building a racially segregated public school system that didn't include schools for American Indians, Lumbee par parents faced a very difficult situation. They could deny their American Indian identity or risk their children may not receive an education. These children that someone's already pointed out here Historians note this as a decade of despair for the Lumbee people as they struggled with this uh, need for education and the battle that they fought for it. But as often is the case, as I've already referred to, God raises up leaders and he raised up seven American Indian men. These were men of significant means. They had land, they had money. It would have been easy for them to sit back and say, you know, this is right after the Civil War. I'm not gonna get involved with this. I'm just gonna take care of me and let somebody else worry about the education of American Indians. But these men got out and they went out and they talked about we must provide education for the next seven generations. And you're looking at about generation six sitting here today. No doubt because of their urging and support, Representative Hamilton McMillan would introduce a bill in the General Assembly to both recognize the Lumbees as American Indians for the state of North Carolina, but as well provide public schools for American Indian children. And it was subsequently in, on March 7th, 1887, that the General Assembly allocated $500. Now in 1887, $500 was a lot of money. So Hamilton McMillan made a strong case for what he was uh, uh, de defending. But this money would be used to establish the Croatan Normal School for Indians. Croatan because Hamilton believed that the Lumbees were descendants of John White's lost colony and the Croatan uh, Indian uh, tribe there. And also Normal because that's the name of a school that teaches teachers. So the vision was we're gonna turn out teachers who will teach our children for the next seven generations. And today, that university is known as the University of North Carolina at Pembroke, almost 8,300 students as of last fall. What a tremendous vision those people had, and look what it's grown into. <laughs> now, thanks to legislation by former House member Ron Sutton, UNC Pembroke is forever designated as North Carolina's historically American Indian University. And UNC Pembroke is distinguished further as being the only accredited four-year institution, university in the United States, which was established by American Indians specifically to teach American Indians. Now, there are other schools that would teach and train American Indians, but, they, but they, this was the only one established by American Indians specifically to teach American Indians. Go that was a, uh, Go Braves. <laughs> that was a legacy set in motion by a series of events that took place 20 years preceding 1887. And those two great legacies came together when three Lumbee Indian brothers, two were furloughed from Fort Fisher and were at home. They were killed by Brant Harris of the Home Guard back in Robinson County. The, uh, subsequently at the inquest of Brant Harris, George Lowry, the father of those of, of three, but two of the, of the two that I'm talking about, Allen and Wesley, gave a very impassioned 
speech about unity and people living together and the importance of white and Indian and black coming together. And it was because of that speech, Hamilton McMillan was in the audience that day and thus sparked his interest in the Lumbee people and thus led to what I've just talked about. He's an avid historian and he became convinced that the Lumbees were descendants of John White's lost colony and the local, local tribe. Today, because of the bold courage of those seven American Indian men and a newly elected representative to the House of North Carolina, UNC Pembroke now celebrates 134 years of preparing students for a brighter tomorrow, educating that next seven generations. As chancellor of this university and a member of the Lumbee tribe, I am proud of what this exhibit represents. The struggle of people to rise above circumstances, much like today, you have circumstances you need to rise above, young folks, to realize a bigger vision than those who would take advantage of circumstances and abuse them. Lumbee people have never forgotten this chapter. And I believe that in general, that the role of the American Indian in the formation of this great country is one that needs to be told and told more often. We don't hear it enough. And so it's very fitting role of the Lumbee, that the role of the Lumbee people is being told here at Fort Fisher as part of the overall narrative of this place. Today is a momentous day at Fort Fisher. I'm proud to be here. I have to point out that my wife, Rebecca, Harvey's cousin, he'll always say, this is my cousin. <laughs> Rebecca, first lady of UNC Pembroke, is back in the audience here with me. But this is the first time that the Lumbee story of conscription is officially being memorialized. It can, it's now part of history. Everyone who comes through that door will read about it. Adding this story to the existing history of Fort Fisher adds more authenticity to the history of this fort about the people who helped build and defend it. It also acknowledges the experience that has lived among Lumbee people for more than 156 years, now documented for the centuries to come. Thank you. I'm proud to be here. Thank you all for all the great work you did. Nancy, again, thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right, speaking last, we have Nancy Fields, Director of the Museum of the Southeast American Indian. It's amazing that we are all standing here, or being here today to honor this history and this memory, and forgive me for taking a few minutes because I'm actually the one that's in the way of the Fuller's Barbecue now. <laughs> <laughs> it was hard to, to put these thoughts together of how this all came about, and you know, we have been formally working uh, with Fort Fisher for the past uh, several years, counting our gap year with COVID, um, on an exhibit. Um, for the new Welcome Center that's opening. So we had already put the wheels in motion to put this content together. And on a very serendipitous day in November of 2019, Ms. Kwan Allen, as we were finishing up a meeting in Raleigh said, do you think the museum could put together an exhibition that would go in the foyer of Fort Fisher and, and uh, fill this casework that we have? And I said, absolutely. Um, little did we know that um, at that time that there was a pandemic that was coming just a few months ahead of us and it would change the course of history. And so as we all adjusted, adjusted our lives and tried to continue with work, um, I think we all felt, I felt like many of us did, that our world was turned upside down. And as myself and Becky Goins, who's in the audience, who's a co-curator, um, worked on the framework uh, to tell the story and start drafting the outline for the script, I really tried to pull from this experience and emotion to understand how Lumbee men would have felt conscripted here. In fact, they would have been dealing with their own epidemics and pandemics of yellow fever, fever and other uh, infectious diseases that they would contract here. All while dealing with the harshness of this environment, the heat that we feel right now, and the deep emotion they would have felt about missing their families, their world was turned upside down. Some of these men suffered through the work and over time made it back to their families by the end of the war. Some ran from here to their homes and hid from being recaptured, while others hid in the swamps within their communities to evade conscription. It's important to remember that Lumbee men died here 
and we don't know where they are, but we know that they're here. Several were murdered while resisting the home guard within their own communities. And we honor every single one of their experiences and every single one of their sacrifices and every single one of their lives. I would like to recognize uh, today, uh, we have Mr. Harris Strickland, who has driven down from Virginia to be with us. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Kenneth Strickland. Mr. Ken is the grandson of Harris Strickland who was conscripted here and how remarkable it is to have a grandson of someone that was here. So please let's give him a round of applause. Um, and to honor the men that were at Fort Fisher, the museum commissioned Mr. Hayes Allen Locklear. I'd like to recognize Hayes for the time come patchwork as a memorial. And if you looked at the exhibit, if you've had a chance to uh, visit the exhibition, you'll see there's a large pine cone patchwork. We took the names that were provided by uh, Mr. Forrest Hazel of 27 confirmed people that were here. We know that there were many more. And some of these names came forth through uh, pension applications or other written records that confirmed their presence here. So although there are only 27 names that are on this patchwork on the fabric that you see in the exhibit, some of us are wearing pins that, that also uh, have this fabric with the names on them. Um, I would like to say their names. I think it is important remembering and honoring their memory by saying their names. So Absalom Brayboy, Isaac Brayboy, Calvin Brayboy, James Brayboy, Quinn Dial, James Dial, Anderson Jen, Marty Goins, Riley Goins, Williamson Jacobs, Thomas Leviner, Alex Locklear, James Locklear, Philip Locklear, Preston Locklear, Whitfield Locklear, William Locklear, Allison Lowry, Jarman Lowry, Wesley Lowry, Hardy Maynard, Ben Oxendine, Hugh Oxendine, James Oxendine, Solomon Oxendine, Harris Strickland, Andrew Strong. And we've added a name just to honor and remember the folks' names we don't know and that is unknown conscript. We continue to do work and research on Fort Fisher to identify the people that were here, many of which could be your ancestors. So if you have stories, please share them with us. Um, I think Becky from Fort Fisher is in the audience and they have um, descendant forms that you can fill out, there she is, uh, to share information uh, with the folks here or with us to continue growing the story and understanding the history um, at Fort Fisher and we are very excited and look forward to uh, there you are we look forward to this exhibit being uh, permanent in the new Welcome Center in the years to come this exhibit was a collaboration of the efforts of many scholars leaders and community I would like to give special thanks to Jeff Curry Dr. Melinda Maynard Lowry Dr. Jamie Martinez Dr. Lawrence Locklear Mr. Kenneth Clark Becky Goins, Karen Bird, and also staff Alicia Monroe, our fantastic interns that I've driven crazy with this exhibit, Tyler Karpovich, Jason Bowen, who was working on a uh, 3D uh, tour for us, and Jess Muniz. So thank you for that. <laughs> and lastly, I would like to honor the following people for their support and work on this project by presenting them with an original pine cone patchwork that features the names of all the people that we know were here and who inspired and supported this exhibit. So if we could have uh, Michelle Lanier, Chairman Godwin, Chancellor Cummings, Jim Steele, and Quan Allen, we would like to present you with a pine cone patchwork over here at this table. for you and there's one on the table for everyone. So I'll, I'll give that to you and then you can lay them back down. <laughs> and Jim, that's for you. like the Quan. And you guys, I cannot say enough about Quan. Um, wordsmithing and redrafting text. She was absolutely amazing and I know that 
we drove each other crazy a little bit. Can you tell us what to do? Okay, right? I just, if everybody can just move down just a little bit and just curve a little bit. Hey. The steamy part at the bottom. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At the bottom, put the steamy part at the bottom, uh, Jim, to, to turn it around. Yeah. <laughs> hey, <it's> amazing. <laughs> okay. Squeeze in there. I can't believe this down. So thank you all again, and please, if you have any stories, if your relatives were here at Fort Fisher, um, if your families hid out from conscription, please share them with us. We would like to expand this exhibition and be able to share a larger experience when the new Welcome Center begins, as well as at our own museum. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Nancy. As we bring this ceremony to a close, I want to remind everybody that this new exhibit is just the latest in a series of collaborations between North Carolina Historic Sites and the Lumbee Tribe. In years past, the Lumbee Tribe and the Museum of the Southeastern American Indian have attended Fort Fisher's anniversary programs where they provided some of the most informative and entertaining displays of all our invited groups. But the highlight for me personally was when Chairman Godwin accompanied the Lumbee Tribe Boys and Girls Club for a first time ever field trip to Fort Fisher. These children had a great time uh, seeing real history, their own history, the story of their people. And by the time Michelle Lanier was done with those children, they understood that they had made history themselves. <laughs> so, and we continue to make history today. This new exhibit will be seen by over a million people in the next couple of years, getting the Lumbee Fort Fisher story out to the world. I hope this, this exhibit is just one in a series of continuing collaborations and visits with our Lumbee friends. I and all the staff of Fort Fisher and North Carolina Historic Sites thank the Lumbee for their contributions. Following this reception, Nancy Fields at one o'clock will do a brief walking tour leaving from right here where I'm standing. So I encourage you to participate in that. I encourage you to go inside, take a close look at the new exhibit, and also encourage you to go get lunch catered by Fuller's Barbecue. So it smells good, and uh, we've been waiting. So in um, any case, it's been a great day, an important day. I thank you for being here, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.